In this video, we're going to take a look at Bragg's Law, and here I've drawn the apostrophe after the S because there are two Braggs involved, a father and son team, William Henry and William Lawrence. Now, what did they do? They started out with experiments by von Laue, who took x-rays. Let's just draw their x-ray beam here as a line with a little arrowhead. And they would take those x-rays and they would bombard a crystal, and they wanted to find out what would happen on the other side. So on the other side, they would set up a target. So let's draw a little target here. You can imagine that target coated with some film, and that film could be exposed to see where the energy might land. And you might expect that as the x-rays would come through, they'd just bundle up here directly opposite the source of the x-ray energy. But that's not what happened. The energy was actually scattered. What they found in their experiments when they exposed the film is that the energy would be concentrated on certain little parts of the film. They'd get a series of dots, and those dots would have some kind of uh, symmetry to them that would reflect the internal symmetry of the atoms inside of the crystal. This uh, set of patterns here would eventually become known as a so-called Lowy pattern. And these experiments were very important because they did a couple of things. They showed that atoms existed. People had been working for a hundred years on ideas related to atomic theory, but without any proof that atoms were real things. But their experiments also showed that, at least in crystals, the symmetry here was reflecting, reflecting an ordered atomic array. So in crystals, the atoms were not necessarily randomly scattered throughout the, the material, and that the external morphology of a crystal probably would relate to an internal arrangement of atoms, as had, as, as had been suspected by many others. So what do we get out of this? How, how, did, how do we use the results of Lowy's experiments? Well, this diagram here by Dexter Perkins does a very nice job of explaining what's happening here and will lead us eventually to Bragg's Law that we'll show here. So for the x-rays, those are our incident beams. Let's change that E to an I. And those waves that are coming in have some fixed wavelength. Let's call that lambda. And they're going to impinge upon this crystal where the atoms are at some fixed distance d. Let's call it d. It'll be the same there, and it's marked there as well. So if we look at the way those waves are scattered, there will be a case where there's a special value of alpha, where as those waves come off for that special value of alpha, the peaks and troughs of the various waves will be lined up. And when that happens, we would say that these are in phase, that the waves are in phase, and we would get what we call constructive interference. And if we have constructive interference, we can add up the energies of all of these. And on a, if we set up a detector here, we, the sum of all those energies would give us a wave with the same wavelength, but a much larger amplitude for the peaks and troughs. And so the detector over here would record a large burst of energy that would represent these white dots over here. Well, what if you pick some other value of alpha? What if the, the diffracted beams are coming off at some other angle that's different from the special angle? Then the peaks and troughs will not line up. We don't get the constructive interference. Instead, we would get destructive interference, and the detector is not going to see this large burst of energy. So that would be these black spaces in between. So we have the special relationship between what we're showing here is alpha, lambda, and d. So the Braggs came along and gave us a similar kind of relationship using the same kinds of variables. But they did something rather clever. They recast the diffraction uh, equation as an issue of reflection. Now, the waves are not really being reflected. If these waves were being reflected, they'd bounce off and we wouldn't see anything here over at the target. But as a mathematical trick, it is helpful, they found it helpful, the Braggs did, to think about it as a problem of reflection. So we have an incident angle, so we have a wave that's coming in, that's this blue ray, and it comes in at this angle theta, which is not this angle alpha. Uh, and we have similar kinds of variables. So there is a lambda, there is a wave of a fixed uh, wavelength here, and it would be the same for this wave here. And then we have a d spacing, a value for d that represents the distance between this layer of atoms here and another layer of atoms here. What happens in this reflection model is this wave comes in, bounces off that top layer, and gives us the, this outgoing wave here. If the incoming wave is coming at coming in at an angle of theta, 
then the outgoing wave will also be at an angle of theta away from that uh, horizontal plane of atoms. That's the law of reflection. The angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And then we have another wave over here. We'll just call it number two. That may, maybe that wave penetrates to a deeper level, hits the second layer of atoms, and it reflects off again at the same angle, also theta. And you can imagine uh, these things are so, so small, it's a near infinite number of layers. We had another layer of atoms here, also at a distance d, so that d value would be fixed. Another wave would come here, bounce off that layer, and would get a reflected wave. Let's rearrange the Bragg's Law. So we will write it this way. We have 2d sine theta is e divided by lambda is equal to n. Now we haven't explained this value of n yet, but this is where it becomes very important. So we're going to take this value theta, the incident angle, we'll take the sine of that angle, multiply it by d, this fixed d spacing for the crystal, multiply that again by 2 and divide by the wavelength of whatever we decide to be the incoming radiation. So if we do that calculation, all those calculations there, and we get this ratio, then we look at the value of n. So what the Braggs discovered is that if n is some whole number, so that whole number could be anything, 1, 2, 3, etc. If it's a whole number, then what will happen is that peaks will align and troughs will align. And as we had over here with a special value of alpha, for this special value of theta for a fixed lambda and d value, we would get constructive interference. So again, we can pick the lambda value. We can decide the kinds of energy and wavelengths that are going to be uh, the x-rays that will impinge on the material. The d value is fixed by the material itself that's being bombarded by x-rays. So what we could do is search for values of alpha where n has a whole number. If you pick some other, excuse me, not alpha, but theta. So if we pick some value of theta uh, where n is not a whole number, let's say it's 1.3 or 2.5, it doesn't matter. What will happen is we won't get this neat alignment of crests and troughs. And if they don't align, instead we would get destructive interference. So if we put a detector over here when n is a whole number, uh, everything lines up and we'd get a very large amplitude wave and lots of energy hitting the detector. But if we pick some value of theta where we get some weird value of n, uh, anything that's not a whole number, not necessarily weird, I suppose, then we, we would get destructive interference between the waves and there would be very little or no energy recorded at the detector. So it's again another way of explaining what we see in a Lowy pattern. Because of this special relationship between d and theta and lambda, we can get certain special values of n where the energy would be concentrated. And then for other combinations, most combinations, we'd just get dark space. So it shows us where and why the energy would be concentrated in a Lowy pattern. We could take advantage of this and set up an experiment where we looked at these, look at these diffracted waves and then try to find alphas where those energies are concentrated. In another uh, video, we'll talk about a so-called diffractogram, which is a way of interpreting uh, using these kinds of relationships to identify minerals. But before we go, I want to show one other application. So we show the atom here as this gray dot, but it's not really a dot, it's a larger atom. It's this guy over here. That would be a larger atom too. Take a look at this. The radius of this atom would be this, and the radius of this atom would be this length here. Well, if we have a pure substance, let's say over here, we let it be pure iron or pure gold or pure anything, anything that's in the periodic chart that we can crystallize, then you'll notice that the distance d here would now be equal to 2 times r, 2 times the radius. So one of the neat things that we get out of doing x-ray diffraction is we could figure out the sizes of atoms. It would be in this very simplistic approach, r would be equal to the d-spacing divided by 2. Well, if you play these kinds of games, the mathematics isn't quite that simple, but it's close to that being that simple. Uh, you can analyze stuff across the periodic chart and start determining the r values that we see in various materials. And then once you have all the pure materials set, you could start combining iron with oxygen and magnesium with oxygen and try to figure out how big the oxygen is if you think you have some constraint on iron and magnesium. Now, the radius of iron won't be the same if it's in the neutral state versus, let's say, the radius of iron in the 2 plus state. 
But again, you could play some games, analyzing different kinds of materials, and start to figure out not only that atoms exist, but how big they are. And we could start uh, determining atomic radii. So that's a very important application. And in another video, we'll show the more relevant application of mineralogy using Bragg's Law and X-ray diffraction to identify minerals.